I'm Bruce Gordon. Twice I had engine flameouts when my engine quit. How I handled those two flameouts, eight years apart, shows the development of a pilot from a young college graduate to an experienced pilot ready for combat in Vietnam. I learned to fly the T-33 jet trainer in Laredo, Texas in 1958. I took this photo from the back seat as we were learning formation flying. I climbed into the tailpipe of a T-33 for this photo showing me as a carefree young fighter pilot ready to take on the world. By 1960, I had transitioned to the F-102 interceptor, but continued to fly the T-33 to get additional flying experience. One day I was flying a T-33 out of Spokane, Washington, going far north over the Canadian Rockies as target for some F-102 interceptors. I was in the front seat and another young lieutenant was in the back seat. It was winter and the snow-capped Rockies of Canada were beautiful as the F-102s made several passes at us. We were flying high at about 35,000 feet along the edge of the troposphere, where the outside temperature was about minus 55 degrees. Our cockpit heaters kept the temperature reasonable inside, but there was ice forming on our windshields, so we had to scrape it away so we could see out. We were flying along, fat, dumb, and happy, enjoying the beautiful snow-covered Canadian Rockies, when suddenly, blurp, the engine quit. What'd you do? What'd you do? My friend asked from the back seat. I didn't do anything, I said. The engine flamed out. It quit. Start the engine, start the engine, he said. Well, I I'd been thinking about that myself. In a moment of crisis, your mind goes back to your training. We were taught, first, aviate, fly the airplane. Second, navigate, find out where you're going. And third of all, communicate, tell others you've got problems so they might be able to help you. All the engine instruments were winding down. The tailpipe temperature was dropping towards zero. The engine RPM was decreasing rapidly. As the engine RPM decreased, we had AC power failure, DC power failure. The boost pump warning lights came on. The master caution light was come on, came on. Start the engine, start the engine. That's all I heard from the back seat. All the engine instruments were up front with me, so he couldn't do anything. I had to do everything. I looked out at those Canadian Rockies. They didn't look so beautiful now. They looked life-threatening. I saw a large mountain field covered with snow and aimed my plane toward there so we could bail out and possibly survive. Why had the engine flamed out? In training, they taught us that the most likely cause was fuel starvation. You hadn't set up your fuel switches correctly. I looked down at my fuel switches. They were all correct. That wasn't the cause. The next most likely cause was ice in the fuel. Little droplets of water in the fuel on the ground turn into little bits of ice that go to the master fuel control and cause engine flame out. We had an emergency fuel control, which was simpler and didn't have those small orifices to get plugged up and so was less likely to ice up, but it did not have a barometric adjustment so that we should not start the engine above 20,000 feet. Start the engine! Start the engine! My friend said from the back seat. 
we can't start now. We're above 20,000 feet. We've got to get down below 20,000 feet, I said. I was aviating, gliding at 140 knots, navigating toward that mountain field where we could bail out. Now it was time to communicate with the rest of the world. I pressed my mic button to give a mayday call, but nothing happened. My transmitter was out. My receiver was working, though. I could hear the controller vectoring the fighters in on another attack on us. I turned my IFF switch to emergency. That would put a big blob on the controller's radar scope and let him know I was in trouble. He saw it all right, because he called, Target, if you read me, turn your IFF to standby. Okay, I read him, so I turned my IFF to standby. Nothing happened. He didn't say anything more. A little bit of time went by, so I turned it back to emergency. He repeated his request. Target, if you read me, turn your IFF to standby. So I turned to stand by again. A minute or so went by. He didn't say anything. So I turned it back on to emergency. One of the fighters called in. Is the target having troubles? Controller replied, well, he seems to be having radio trouble. He turns his IFF to emergency and then back to standby and then back to emergency. That's the signal for radio trouble. Well, the fighter replied, the target seems to be descending. Descending, all right. I was coming down toward those Canadian Rockies, and they were getting bigger and meaner as I got closer to them. Start the engine, start the engine, my friend said again. Well, I was a young pilot, and he began to make logic to me. Those Canadian mountains were coming up, and maybe I'll try starting the engine. We were still well above 20,000 feet, but I switched to the emergency fuel control and started the engine. When I flipped on the ignition switch, there was a rumble in the tailpipe, and I was happy to see the RPM increase, and the tailpipe temperature was lifting off of zero and going on up. I was happy for a few moments. The tailpipe temperature continued to rise right into the red zone and finally pegged at a thousand degrees. I considered shutting off the engine, but I was so glad to see something warm back there and some RPM that I let it go. After a few seconds, the tailpipe temperature came down as the RPM increased, the generators came back on, the caution lights went out, and the radio came back on. I declared an emergency and landed back at Spokane, Washington. I had overtemped and ruined an engine because I had failed to follow the procedures that I had been taught. I had let the fears of the moment overcome my rational judgment. Eight years passed. I continued to fly fighters and T-33s, became an instructor pilot, and moved to Selfridge Air Force Base in Michigan. A general came by the squadron and wanted a flight down to a base in Florida. We had a policy never to let generals fly alone because they make too many mistakes. So I was assigned to fly with him. The general got in the front seat and I got in the back seat and soon we were climbing out and leveling off at about 35,000 feet, heading down to Florida. It was a beautiful day. We were flying along, fat, dumb, and happy, when suddenly, bloop, the engine quit. Flame out, cried the general. How do I start this thing? You don't, sir, I replied. Set up a glide at 140 knots, Turn to a heading of 140 for Little Rock Air Force Base. That's our closest suitable airfield. And turn your IFF to emergency. Our radio transmitter 
didn't work, which didn't surprise me. But our receiver worked, and the controller promptly saw our IFF emergency squawk and cleared us down through several layers of airliners as we descended in a glide toward Little Rock Air Force Base. I got out my checklist, and when we got down to 20,000 feet, I read out the instructions step by step. The general threw the switches. We started the engines, and soon we were on our way with everything working. The difference between these two incidents was pilot experience. I had learned a valuable lesson that applies throughout life. Usually, it's best to pause and think out your options before you act. Thinking before acting even applies to fighter tactics. In many practice engagements, I learned that when you first see the enemy fighters, you plan your attack. The Air Force had a motto, every man a tiger. A tiger does not hunt and kill with a fury. A tiger hunts and kills with a plan. We learned to be tigers.